a lot of our clinician educators do research. So from the standpoint of being accountable and being um, careful about what we advise for you, I think you're in the best hands. So at this time, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Antoine Trammell, who happens to be a graduate of Fisk University, just like I am. So welcome, fellow Fiskite, um, Dr. Trammell. And after Dr. Trammell's presentation, we will hear from Ms. Jordan Cook, who is one of the coordinators for Dr. Wharton's study. Dr. Trammell. Thank you, Dr. Parker. I appreciate that very gracious introduction. It was very kind. All right. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. All right. You should see a slide called African American Brain Aging Stand Study. Uh, as Dr. Parker said, I'm Antoine Trammell, and I am a primary care physician. I'm an internist, and I also have been learning about the neurosciences and cognition for several years now. Dr. Parker is one of my collaborators, and I'm also proud that we share a connection to Nashville and Fisk University. I do have a few disclosures as a matter of housekeeping. Some of the funding for this study comes from the Alzheimer's Association, as well as the um, Coastal Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. I also have funding from the Georgia Department of Human Services for the Georgia Alzheimer's Project. And that funds a clinic wherein I see individuals who have issues with their memory and thinking abilities downtown at Grady. Also, I have some photos in this slide just to say that no one gets to where they are alone. And through the graciousness of good mentors, you see myself as Dr. E. Have a jar on the left. And with the assistance of funding agencies and people who are supportive of my research endeavors, on the right, you see the chief science officer, Dr. Maria Carrillo for the Alzheimer's Association. You know, through their help and guidance, I'm able to do this research and spend this time talking with all of you today. The guiding principle of my work is eloquently expressed in the Tao Te Ching. We shape clay into a pot, but it is the emptiness inside that holds whatever we want. We hammer wood for a house, but it is the inner space that makes it livable. We work with being but non-being is what we use. So while in medicine and research, we work with bodies, the brain, the heart, we use what's intangible. We're trying to preserve the mind and experiences. And a very meaningful aspect of experience in the mind for me is storytelling. This screenshot is from the Library of Congress website. And one of my favorite things to read are the slave narratives that were developed, or I should say they were put together during the New Deal, the 1930s and the Great Depression under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So he sent academics out to interview some of the last living slaves at the time. And this example of storytelling for me has been a profound and wonderful connection to my past that can help me understand who I am today and then decide where I wish to go tomorrow. While some of the stories are truly lamentable, there's also a lot of inspiration as I read about achievement and I see attitudes of resilience that are quite inspirational. So I want to help everyone maintain some type of continuum with themselves through storytelling, to continue to enjoy meaningful experience in life and have an intact mind. You see, as Alzheimer's and other dementias rob someone of their mind, it affects their loved ones, their entire families. A little background about my study, STAND, which stands for, no pun intended, 
Spinalactone safety in African Americans with cognitive impairment and early dementia. So African Americans are at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease and dementias. Why? Well, we do have a high burden of diseases that affect our heart and blood vessels, such as high blood pressure. So the health of the heart and the blood vessels affects the brain. They're indeed connected, right? The heart, the blood vessels, they feed the brain. So anytime you have problems with the heart and the blood vessels, you can have very silent brain damage over time. The brain doesn't have the ability to tell you that it's hurting. It doesn't have pain receptors. Like if you stump your toe, you say, ouch, that hurt. The brain is not able to do, to do that. Instead, any damage that occurs over time, any pain can manifest with problems thinking and the ability to remember information, what we call cognition. African-Americans, or I should say people of African ancestry can have a chemical imbalance in their body that can predispose them to develop problems with their heart and blood vessels. This chemical imbalance involves a hormone called aldosterone. Aldosterone controls blood pressure and it regulates how blood vessels work, meaning getting wider, getting smaller. So the blood flow can be properly maintained throughout the body. While African-Americans or people of African ancestry can have a high level of this hormone in their body that leads to damage to blood vessels and the heart, which leads to damage to the brain and that manifests as problems thinking and remembering information. So overall, this study will explore the relationship between high aldosterone and brain aging in African-Americans. The problem gets worse with stress. So it is reported and widely known that African-Americans do experience a fairly high burden of stress. Well, interestingly, high stress or chronic stress, I should say, can also result in higher levels of aldosterone. So it's pretty much a toxic combination when you have high levels and baseline of this hormone in your body, coupled with high stress that leads to more damage of the blood vessels, the heart, thus more damage to the brain, and help you kind of have a better feel for why African-Americans can be at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease and other causes of dementia. So STAND is a one-year study, and we aim to enroll 30 African-American adults age 50 and older. We're going to divide them into two groups. One group will receive an inactive pill or placebo. The other will receive a blood pressure medication called spironolactone. I chose spironolactone because it blocks the effects of aldosterone in the heart and the brain. During the one year, participants will receive or undergo memory and thinking tests and a non-invasive measure of blood vessel stiffness, meaning nothing's gonna be stuck into your body. We will do some blood draws and there is an optional spinal tap or lumbar puncture just to look for chemical changes in the body um, that, are, that can occur with Alzheimer's disease. The spinal tap is optional. So the goals of the study, we want to determine if older African-American adults with some type of memory or thinking issue can tolerate spironolactone and is it safe to use? We need to do this step before we can design a larger study with more people. We also wish to determine potential treatment benefits of spironolactone. As we're evaluating thinking and memory, we'll see and blood vessel stiffness, we'll compare those, um, those tests from the beginning of the study to the end of the study after one year. And this can also help justify a larger study with more people. So just a little bit about spironolactone in case you're wondering. As a drug, it was approved in 1960 and it's widely used in clinical care for heart problems, even liver problems, high blood pressure and fluid overload. For the study, we're gonna start at 25 milligrams, which is the lowest dose and increase to 50 milligrams. The highest available dose is 400 milligrams. 
And there are some occasions where spironolactone is used for non-blood vessel related conditions such as acne and excess hairiness on the body. And that's where you see the dose of 400 milligrams. But we're keeping it low because we want to, again, focus on safety. And the lower doses have been found to work for blocking aldosterone in the brain and the heart. In addition to exploring the relationship between aldosterone and brain aging, African Americans are underrepresented in research, including clinical studies, clinical trials. Clinical trials where you test some type of intervention, in this case, spironolactone. While the greatest expected increase in Alzheimer's disease and other dementias is going to occur in two areas of the United States, Southeast and the Western US. It just so happens that the largest population of African Americans reside in the Southeastern US. So not only are we working to increase research representation of African Americans, but we're also working in a high risk area and with a high risk population for dementia. So overall, these outcomes, we hope to support future research that preserve memory and thinking in an at-risk population to storytelling. We also hope to eventually find, find something, excuse me, that can help people maintain a high quality of life with brain aging and increase diversity of um, research samples for cognitive studies. We would love to hear from you. So please contact us below you see photo of myself and my coordinator, Ms. Kirsten Johnston. And you can email her, you can also call her with the information provided. And at this time, I shall turn it back over to Dr. Monica Parker. Thank well, you. we've got a couple of questions, Dr. Trammell, and you gave a very detailed talk about hypertension and some of these risk factors. And one of the questions is, what is fluid overload? Can you kind of explain what that is? And they're, they're sort of like, okay, this is new information for me. How is one tested for aldosterone? And that's not really a test that primary care doctors order. Right, right. Uh, thank you for that question. I was trying to keep the language very simple and on a lay level. So I apologize for any language that you did not comprehend. So if anyone else has a question about a term or word that I used, please ask. Fluid overload is sometimes, in, in clinical medicine, we call it edema. I don't know if you've seen someone who has a heart problem and their legs swell. That's fluid overload, swelling in a part of the body. So that can occur from heart problems, that can occur from liver problems. And I hope that answers the question. Fluid overload, you said fluid overload, but you didn't say congestive heart failure. You know, I, a lot of times we, we think of those as the same thing. Well, I, I didn't say congestive heart failure in particular because there are other health conditions that can cause that swelling. I did mention liver problems, but kidney problems can also cause it. So there are a number of pathways to get to a state of being overloaded. All right, I'm, I'm looking through the chat, trying to field any particular questions you had, people had, and there are lots of thank yous for an excellent presentation that they were able to follow. Uh, Ms. Danzi has put in the information about the STAN study contact, Ms. Kristen Johnson, um, and her telephone number. I do see one more question, Dr. Parker. How okay. is one tested for aldosterone? It is a blood test. Now, aldosterone is not routinely tested in clinical medicine. We usually look for that in individuals who have blood pressure that is difficult to control. So that's why you may not be familiar with it because it's just not a part of routine practice. Okay. Right, if there are any extra questions for Dr. Tremel, um, please put them in the question Q&A or in the chat. At this time, it's 2.27, you let us finish up a little on time, uh, Dr. Tremel. 
I call you Trammell, it's Trammell, okay. That's fine. But um, at this time we'll have Ms. Jordan Cook, who is the coordinator for Dr. Whitney Wharton, who's been here a number of times talking about uh, similar studies that have to do with um, high blood pressure and other things that are monitored and being looked at as something else to be measured when you're looking at Alzheimer's, something besides just doing a memory screen. It, there are other things that we're looking at diagnostically to help us arrive at the proper diagnosis for somebody who may be having difficulties with the way their brain works. So today, Ms. Cook is going to talk to us about the LGBTQ opportunities for research participation. Jordan? Yes, thank you so much. I am just getting this ready for y'all. There is one study in the Q&A that says, can an allergy to a blood pressure medication cause swelling? Um, I can answer this, but Dr. Trammell, would you like to? Sure. Um, an allergy to a blood pressure medication can cause swelling. Um, in particular, we've seen swelling in the face, um, lips, and the throat area, but not so much in the legs or, say, the arms. Thank you. Jordan, are you ready? I think so. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, just one second. Okay, thank you so much for having me today. I'm sorry Dr. Wharton couldn't be here, but I'm happy to share the project with her. We're gonna be talking about research opportunities for the LGBTQIA plus population with memory concerns and caregivers. So the project title um, that we'll be talking about is called RISE. It stands for Research Inclusion Supports Equity. A little bit about RISE. It's a research study being conducted by Emory University, the University of Las Vegas, Nevada, and the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, it includes a research registry that's created to help ensure the LGBTQIA plus population is represented in Alzheimer's research. So the registry is for LGBTQIA plus people 18 and older who have memory concerns or a memory loss diagnosis, such as Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. Also, the, oh, Jordan, go ahead. Would you mind explaining what LGBTQIA means? Some yes, definitely. Yes, so the LGBTQIA plus population is an acronym for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual populations. Um, so those are different gender identities and sexual orientations that kind of compromise one group. Is that a good explanation? They'll tell you if they don't understand. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and so the, the registry is also for uh, those in the population, the community, who are helping care for someone with memory loss or a memory loss diagnosis. So why are we doing this? Um, a concerted national effort to recruit the community into ADR, which is Alzheimer's disease or related dementia uh, related research does not exist. So increasing inclusion and engagement of LGBTQIA plus individuals will allow for future development of targeted interventions and prevention studies in this underserved community. So this is just another example of an underserved community that we're trying to engage into research. Um, of course, there's importance of inclusion in all research because it allows for equal representation and a concerted effort for all underserved groups. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this issue brief. It just kind of gives some um, data to explain why this research is also needed. It's by the Alzheimer's Association and SAGE, which is Advocacy and Services for LGBT Elders, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Um, there's different variations of the acronym that people use, and they use LGBT for this issue brief. So we know that age is the greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and an estimated 2.7 million LGBTP people are over age 50. 
Um, LGBTQIA plus people have greater health disparities, many of which are risk factors for dementia. So those include depression, obesity, alcohol and tobacco use, uh, lower rates of preventative screenings. We'll talk about a little bit why that happens later. Uh, cardiovascular disease, HIV AIDS, we know that 7.4% of the community is actually living with dementia, so the LGBTQIA plus community. And LGBTQIA plus adults living with dementia face unique challenges in accessing support. So 40% report that their support networks have become smaller over time. 34% live alone. Up to 30% experience lower rates of access to care. We know that Alzheimer's is the most expensive disease in the nation, and 51% of LGBTQIA plus people report being very concerned about having enough money to live on. Um, fear of discrimination can delay that access to care because 40% say their healthcare providers don't know about their sexual orientation. So that's something that people um, often don't feel comfortable disclosing. According to the National Resource Center on LGBT Aging, LGBTQIA plus people become caregivers more often. And overall, less is known about health and related needs of LGBTQIA plus adults living with dementia and their caregivers. So that's another reason why this research is important. So it's a national endeavor and it's compromised of three different sites. So um, we are a site here at Emory University. Dr. Whitney Wharton is our principal investigator. We have Dr. Joel Anderson, who is a co-principal investigator from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And then Dr. Jason Flatt, who is another co-principal investigator at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. We have some co-investigators on the project helping out. Dr. Andrea gilmore Bikowski from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Dr. N. Maritza Dowling from George Washington University, Dr. Jaime Perales Pucholt from University of Kansas, and Dr. Jennifer Manley from Columbia University. We also have um, a national advisory board that helps advise all three sites, as well as local community advisory boards at each site. So there's a community advisory board in Atlanta, in Knoxville, and in Las Vegas, and they're helping us uh, throughout the study. So I just want to go over some of the aims of the study. Uh, there's three of them, and first we want to form a network of LGBTQIA plus community members service providers, clinicians, and researchers with the expertise in working with this community uh, living with ADRD, Alzheimer's disease or related dementia, and those in the community who are caregivers. And we'll do this using a community-based participatory research model. So we wanna establish a research registry of over a thousand people. We actually just started the registry not that long ago and we have about 256 registrants so far. This project will last three years. So we're actually increasing that number to 2,500. And um, regardless of the number, we want about half of the people in the registry to be living with Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. And we want the other half of the community to be caregivers. Um, and we'll do this through tailored recruitment and engagement programs. Then we'll develop a replicable model for recruitment and retention of LGBTQIA plus people with Alzheimer's disease or related dementia and caregivers into ADRD clinical research. Um, so I want to show you the registry, and it's a little hard to see, but I'm going to go through the questions just so you can kind of see what we're asking folks in this community as they register into our registry. So we will get their name, their age, uh, phone number and email. We'll ask for race, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, which is how someone um, classifies their gender, whether it be man, woman, trans man, trans woman, I should say cisgender, trans woman, or um, sorry, cisgender man or woman, which is just uh, if you identify, if you were born um, man or woman, at, if you were born female or male at birth and also identify as female or male. 
Um, and so we asked some of those questions like, and we asked uh, whether they're a caregiver currently. We asked uh, if they've had memory or thinking has been getting worse in the last year, if they've seen a healthcare provider for those concerns, if they got a diagnosis for those concerns. Um, and then we want to know if they want to be involved in like focus groups about this kind of stuff or participate in extra like questionnaires. So we also ask that um, on the registry as well. So why do we want people to register? Um, by registering and being a part of this community, they will receive notice of research opportunities related to aging or caregiving in their area and nationally, opportunities to participate in educational and advocacy events, either online or in person, invites to participate in additional questionnaires, interviews, or focus groups related to aging and the LGBTQIA population, and LGBTQIA plus friendly resources for adults with memory concerns and LGBTQIA plus caregivers. So uh, because we're collecting like zip code and email, we'll be able to notify registrants about resources in their area or research opportunities that they can take part in because uh, the main part of this is to get uh, this community engaged in different research as it relates to Alzheimer's disease and aging. So uh, speaking of events, we do have one coming up. It's called Caring for Our Own. It's about dementia resources, opportunities, and challenges for the LGBTQIA plus community. So it'll be over Zoom on June 16th at 6 p.m. It's actually in partnership with Atlanta Pride. Um, and the link is on here. I can also throw that in the chat in a little bit. Um, so if you're interested in that, please feel free to join us. Uh, it should be uh, an engaging conversation. We also have a website that you can visit. It's theriseregistry.org. And that kind of gives a little bit more information about the project. You can view the resources. Uh, you can contact us on there. Well, there's a contact uh, information and our social media, which I will show next if you're on social media. You can get in touch with us by emailing uh, the Wharton Lab at emory.edu. If you're on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, we can be found at the Rise Registry. And if you, uh, you know, belong to the LGBTQI plus community and have memory concerns or memory loss diagnosis, or you are a caregiver for someone with memory loss or memory loss diagnosis, you can register uh, by using the QR code if you'd like to be a part of the registry. Or uh, if you don't identify into the community, if there's someone that you know of that might be interested, um, you can let them know and they can register using the link here that I can also put into the chat. Um, so thank you so much for letting me present today on behalf of Dr. Whitney Wharton. I really appreciate it. Um, and if you have any questions, I can go ahead and take those. Well, there, there was, Jordan, a question in the chat, and I'm not really sure that you can answer it. And the question was, what can we learn that's statistically different about this population by this population's participation in research? And the short answer is, one of the reasons we do the educational outreach that we're doing right now is to be sure that we understand what differences there may be in people who aren't um, represented by the majority of the population. The United States is still predominantly Europe of European American descent. And a lot of the research, a lot of the medications, a lot of the diagnostic procedures that have been developed for any disease state have been tested primarily on people who are of European American descent. Now you can look at many of us who are a little browner and not pale, and many of us have elements of some European American history in our genes, in our genetic gene pool. But more often than not, there are other genes that need to come into play and that have a role in disease development. We just don't know what they are. So whether you are a person of color who happens to be um, uh, 
of this uh, specialized group, we're not sure what those differences mean. Um, we're not sure what any of this means. So there's a special effort in research to try to be, I like to say everybody's, um, everybody needs to inc be included. So when it comes to disease states and learning more about them, all of us want a trophy. All of us want a trophy because we're participating in some meaningful way to make sure that any treatments that we develop, any diagnostic procedures that we develop are as efficacious and in impactful for any group. So what works for this group may work differently for another group. That's why we need everybody to participate in research. And uh, because we're in a state where we recognize that people's differences do make a difference in how people respond to treatments and medications, if you will, that are developed to treat different disease processes, even hypertension, just like Dr. Trammell was, was, alluded, was talking about a little bit earlier. We're not sure about all those differences. So the more we know about how people are different and what works for this group, what doesn't work for that group, it's important. Most preliminary research in Alzheimer's was not done on women. It was done on men. So a lot of the treatments that we're using for treating and managing Alzheimer's were not developed for women who were white, women who were black, or women who were Native American. So it's important that we get all of these different groups included to see what is different. And so I think all of us know that men's bodies are different from women's bodies. And then women who are... Um, People who are transgender may be on hormonal therapies that may make them more susceptible to certain disease states. We, we don't know, we don't know yet. But science hasn't caught up with everything that goes on with our um, population. So um, the registry is designed to try to engage people who are from the LGBTQIA um, community. I've, I've got to add all those different consonants. I can't remember it. I can get LGBTQ. And it's always, always changing. Yeah, we're, we're, it, it is changing. We're always changing. But suffice it to say that all of us are unique beings and all of us as unique beings need to be participating in clinical research just to make sure that our health care my individual health care, your individual health care is the best that it can possibly be. So RISE is a registry, which means we're not putting you in a study. We're trying to make sure that you, if you, there is a study out there and you want to be included, they want to make sure that you get that notification. So I like to say that our educational outreach here at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center is colorless, it's genderless. So the information that you get here on Tuesdays from two to three o'clock goes for anybody. We need everybody to participate. So with that, I think that they have um, put in the connection for the RISE registry in our chat. And if you have interest in being in a part of a national registry uh, for people with a sexual minority of a sexual minority or gender minority, and you want to be included specifically in research that may be tailored for that group, please sign up for the RISE registry. But all of our educational outreach, all of our studies are open to anybody, regardless of gender, regardless of what your socioeconomic status is or your ethnic identity is. And there's a question in the Q&A for Dr. Tremel. Dr. Tremel, there you are. He may have stepped away. No, I'm okay. here. I'm, I'm looking okay. for the question. It's right. under the q and A. I, I I can read it out loud. Do you see it? Says the question is, does the medication spironolactone have multiple benefits? Does the medication spironolactone have multiple benefits? That is a great question. And the answer is yes, it can have multiple benefits. Why? Because it affects the blood vessels. So if this if this drug affects the blood vessels, not only can it improve the delivery of blood and remember what's in blood oxygen and nutrients that the organs need like the brain it can also have beneficial effects on the heart also i mentioned that the hormone aldosterone can increase in the body in response to stress so there might potentially be i'm not going to say with any 
and I don't want to speak with um, a lot of certainty to say this because I don't know if it's been proven yet, but there, there may be some role for spironolactone to block some of the st stress responses in the body, which also can cause our health to be poor. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Dr. Tremel. Okay, there's a question. Women in hormones, spironolactone as a treatment for excessive hair growth. Polycystic ovarian syndrome. I guess that's what they're talking about. Yes, that's PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And that, that is correct. Now, it is used at higher doses for excessive hair growth. The medical term is called hirsutism, but that, that is correct. Does this mean that it may be a desired <laughs> side effect for any women in the study? I, I'm not sure because the dose is different. And you need 35 individuals, correct? I'll take 35. We're going for 30, <laughs> but yeah, I'll take 35. Okay. Well, as Dr. Parker said, you know, we're here to educate, but we're also here to recruit. So we would love for Dr. Tremble's coordinator to get inundated with telephone calls about your interest in the study. So Deja and Crystal, they're going to drop that telephone number. And if I don't know if you know it by heart, Dr. Tremble, how to reach um, Miss Montgomery. Is it Montgomery? I see it. It is 404-712-6806. I just lost it. No, it's there. 404-712-6806. And it's Kirsten Johnson. Let's work her hard. <laughs> she's, she's, um, she's new. She just started uh, a couple months ago, and she's ready to, to really hit the ground running. So I'm going to tell Kirsten to put on her sneakers, her running shoes, and we're going to get going. All right. Um, I think this brings us pretty much to the end of our program. We probably usually close with a five-minute uh, interview with uh, or update from the Cognitive Empowerment Program with Matt Warren. And I don't see Matt on here today, but our Cognitive Empowerment Program usually follows immediately after this one. Um, I, think, I think Deja can post our next upcoming speakers, I think next week. Um, next week we have with us uh, Jelaine Arias, who is a, an attorney. She is now teaching at Georgia State University, who's gonna to talk to us about the ethics of research. What kind of protections do you have? Are you eligible for when you participate in clinical research? And how does participation in clinical research affect my private information, particularly my insurance coverage and my healthcare benefits? So Jelaine Arias, I She's not a doctor. A lot of times on this program, we have like medical doctors, but next week, Jelaine Arias, who is a law professor at Georgia State University, will be here talking with us next week about ethics in clinical research. So anytime we tell people, people want to participate in research and they bring up some problem in the past, we're going to talk about how some of those things that might have happened before would never happen in research today and what are some of your protections. As you look at the map, the uh, upcoming speakers for the rest of this month on the 21st, we're going to have a discussion on hospice and palliative care and Medicare and how that benefit works for those of us who are caring for people who have a di diagnosis of dementia. We'll also hear from Dr. Glenna Brewster later on in this month about her sleep study. And then finally, on the 28th of June, we're going to be hearing from our Georgia Memory Net and uh, learning about case management for new diagnosis. Now, what do I mean by that? Case management is, okay, my dad, my mom now has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. What are we going to do? We're going to learn about the resources that are available for families to manage what happens when you've been given a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And then Later on, we have more speakers, but I think I've lined you up for what goes on for the rest of this month. Ah, there's our Matt. Okay, Matt, I'm going to leave it at that. So next week, people, uh, 
Jelaine Arias, an attorney, will be talking about the ethics and research participation, and we're going to learn more about what our rights are as we participate in research. Matt. Hey everyone, so in a few moments we're going to be um, having CEP Community Live, that is a different uh, webinar hosted here at Emory. Um, today we're, we have a, a new speaker, we're going to be joined by Amy Rodriguez, she's uh, our uh, clinical core lead, so she is one of the leaders of the Cognitive Empowerment Program, she's going to be talking to us uh, today about MCI and, um, uh, and cognition, so I hope to uh, see you all there. I'll be posting the link to register for our webinar in a moment. If you've already registered once, you're um, just use the same link again, and hope to see everyone in a few minutes. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Matt. And we do have another program to announce in addition to the RISE program that's going on next week um, on June 16th. This Friday, um, the Glazewetta Alzheimer's Disease Research Program is conducting another program uh, in the community, the impact of emotional and physical stress on brain health and aging. Our presenters will be Dr. Ehab Hajar, Dr. Sherry Broadwater, who is a psychiatrist, and myself and some other people who are from the community who will also be pre presenting. Again, this Friday, there is a program called The Impact of Emotional and Physical Stress on Brain Health and Aging. It's a virtual program. There's a registration link. It's called Emory Brain Health and Stress.eventbrite.com. So thank you all so much for your participation. And this concludes our presentation for today.